ان الحمد لله وحده والصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم all praise to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah's choicest most in blessings be upon prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam we are again uh, in this session we are we are thankful to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allows us to have these sessions of knowledge in which we learn the deen and we can make our dunya and our akhirah better in today's session we are going to talk about one of the important discussion regarding our nafs as we know that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us in such a way that we are having certain biological needs and these biological needs when we see that it is not specific to the human beings rather even animals they also share these characteristics with us so at this level as far as the biological need is concerned humans and the animals are same there's no difference specifically when we see these biological needs like we need the we need the food to eat we cannot survive without the food likewise animals they cannot survive without the food we need the we need the water to drink and animals also need water to drink and then at a certain age at a certain level we need the gratification of the sexual needs so animals also have this the only difference between the animals and the humans is that that allah subhanahu wa taala has created us for a specific objective and he has blessed us with the reason with the aql which the animals are not blessed with we cannot say they do, they that they don't have the reason rather their emotions and biological needs dominate their reason so their instincts govern them on the other hand human being has been blessed with the reason to make effective use of the reason to act, to actualize the reason and by actualization of reason they can make many things which which sets him apart from the animal folk so as far as these basic biological needs are concerned islam teaches us how to contain them how to moderate them so that uh, a person is saved from the harmfulness of these needs as allah subhanahu wa taala puts these needs in our in, in our nature as a means of test also as a means of test otherwise allah subhanahu wa taala could have created only such things which are lawful and then there was no question of just you don't have to go you don't have to go close to this you don't have to uh, eat this food you don't have to consume this particular form of uh, meat allah subhanahu wa taala would have just made a one single uh, uh, we can say a flat the menu for all but why he created many things as a means of test as we know that the life is meant to be tested so all the things which are connected to our life There, there is a this element of test is existing over there. Whether we need the food to eat, yes, there is a test in it. We need the water to drink. There are many forms of beverages, and there is again a test for us. And again, at a certain age, at a certain level, a person needs the, his partner. But there are many ways to gratify the. to gratify one's own need one's own desire to satiate his desire there are many ways again to test a person allah subhanahu wa taala says in surah al-mulk alladhi khalaqa al-mawta wal hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala wa huwa al-aziz al-ghafur wa huwa alladhi khalaqa al-mawta wal hayat it is allah subhanahu it is allah subhanahu wa taala who created the death and the life الذي خلق الموت والحياه 
who created the death and the life liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala so that he tests he tests you which one of you is best in deeds wa huwa al-azizul ghafur and he is tremendously forgiving the sins of his servants when they seek his repentance so life is meant to be tested so, so today in our in this session we are going to just focus upon the test in the form of eating and drinking and sexual desire as these are three important things as I, as i said we are biological beings we have the biological needs <clears throat> these biological biological dem- demands or these organic needs have to be addressed as per the commands of the islam and those who address these de- needs or these appetite or these demands under the command of the islam this conception of the food gratifying one's own desire becomes a form of ibadah as we know that basic purpose of our life is to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are various forms of worship and this worship or this element of worship must be reflected through all our actions whether we are eating the food we are taking we are drinking anything a person is a person is gratifying his desire whatever way whatever things we are doing it must be reflected at all places the element of worship the element of our test the element of our servitude to allah subhanahu wa taala and uh, imam al ghazali rahimahullah he says the appetite of eating and drinking is one of the most heinous means of destruction it caused adam to leave paradise and it stimulates the sexual appetite and the desire for collect- collecting wealth in addition to so many flaws that emerge as a result of the satisfaction of this appetite it was reported that the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alaihi wasallam said a believer eats in one inst- in intestine that is is satisfied with a little food and a disbeliever eats in seven intestines that is eats much food hadith is recorded by imam al-bukhari and imam muslim uqba ar-rasibi said once i entered upon al-hasan al-basri rahimahullah while he was having the lunch he asked me to join him but i said i have eaten my full so i cannot eat any more glory be to allah should a muslim eat until he cannot eat any more he commented some ascetics went beyond limits in suppressing their desire for food and resisting the pain of hunger of course this is not fair because what man is entitled to do is to satisfy his desire moderately this moderation is realized in its best form when the muslim follows the prophet's instructions in this regard namely to make a third of his belly for food a third for drink and a third for breath this makes his body healthy and protects it from diseases so when we see adam peace be upon him when he was taken out of the jannah out of the paradise what was the main reason for his expulsion from paradise the main reason was allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid him to have fruit of a specific tree la taqraba hadhihi ash-shajarata fa takuna min al-zalimin do not approach this tree otherwise you shall be among the wrong doers and what was that tree there's a difference of opinion among the scholars that that's not important that what kind of tree it was what kind of fruit it was what is important the message the lesson we have in, we have there there are many lessons so one of the lesson one of the lessons is that uh, the what what shaitan what he triggered he triggered the passion for the food and this passion for the food was connected to the passion for this dominating the world and th- this passion for the food triggered another passion that is to achieve the eternity that's what quran says us when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded adam peace be upon him eve peace be upon her that kulu washrabu you eat and drink in the jannah but wala taqraba hadhihi ash-shajarata but do not approach to the specific tree you see here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said wala taqula min hadhihi ash-shajarah and do not eat from this from this tree 
these are two different expressions the expression should have been wala taqula min hadhihi shajara and do not eat from this from this tree but allah said wala taqraba hadhihi shajara do not come closer to it not to talk about touching it or eating it do not come close to it is a metaphor that you should always stay away from it you avoid your 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 appetite of having this fruit you have to restrict you have to abstain yourselves you have to restrain and refrain yourselves to have the fruit of this particular tree and from this we can we learn many of the ahkam that whatever thing is forbidden by islam and if anything or whatever thing can take a person to that thing to that prohibition to, to 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 that prohibition a person is highly is strictly commanded to stay away from such means as well allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the quran wala taqrabu zina don't approach to the fornication but in islam fornication adultery there is all the same there is no difference uh, but uh, Uh, in the western parlance there is a difference between the two but in our case it is all together whether it is adultery or fornication it is all forbidden it is all prohibited there is no scope for, for for any of these two evils so quran said wala taqr uh, la taqrabu zina don't approach to it means it means that any instrument any tool or any means which can take a person to this stage is altogether haram is altogether prohibited so means to the haram are also prohibited that's what hafiz bin qudama says rahimahullah inna wasilat al harami haram the means to the prohibition is itself prohibited any means or any way or any tool or any instrument which take a person to the prohibition that tool means or instrument it also prohibited so what shaitan triggered allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran shaitan the here we, we we differ with the with the uh, old testament statement which 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 lays the blame upon hawa alayhi salam that it was it is in genesis chapter 3 starts with this that it was the satan who entered into the paradise in the form of a serpent then he first of all he misled hawa alayhi salam and it was hawa alayhi salam who forced adam peace be upon him to have the fruit of the particular tree and on the basis of this thing they say woman is the root of all evil it's not mentioned in the bible but from there they got this idea that woman is the root of all evil but islamic uh, explanation to this specific specific event is altogether different even it gives more weightage to the fact that it was adam peace be upon him who was first targeted by shaitan though many expressions says together he misled them but some expression says the which which lays more weightage to this fact that it was adam peace be upon him who initiated the first who initiated it first and he he approached adam peace be upon him and said to him hal adulluka ala shajaratil khuld and here again you see hal adulluka ka is a pronoun is a second person it is it is used with the person who is being addressed second person singular ka if it is second person plural then it must or, or dual it must be kuma if it is second person plural it must be kum because unlike the english in arabic we don't have singular and plural in english we have singular is one more than one or plural but in arabic one is singular wahid two they are not two is not considered to be plural rather it is dual that is tasniya more than two are considered to be as plural or jam'un so he he uses the pronoun single second person second person singular that is ka hal adulluka ala shajaratil khuld o adam peace be upon him o adam should i not lead you to the tree of eternity shajaratul khuld the tree of eternity wa mulkin la yabla and the kingdom which will never perish unending everlasting 
kingdom, unperishable kingdom. Two things. Shajaratul Khuld, it will give you the eternity. Means if you eat this fruit, that's what I said, the food is connected to the eternity. Means you will achieve the eternity. No doubt many of foods have many nutritious values and to keep us healthy. But this, there is no food which will grant us eternity, which can be a medicine to the death, which can be a cure to the death. That's deadly impossible. There is no such food. But he just made his mind up that if you have the fruit of this particular tree, then you will achieve eternity. Hal adulluka ala shajaratul khuld. Khuld means eternity. Wa mulk and the dominion. La yabla, which will never perish. This was the thing he triggered. It's not just the taste of the food alone. Rather, there were certain things connected to it. Same thing happens to us. This, when the, our desire for dunya starts up, it grows slowly, 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 slowly. Then a person doesn't want the normal food. He must have the delicious and tasty food all the time. And then that delicious and tasty food is not specific or individual in this character. It has, it, is, it has connection now. That person must have the branded clothes, expensive clothes. And then again, it's, it doesn't stop there. Now he must have a hi-fi and most expensive car. And then it doesn't stop there. Now he is having that most delicious food, expensive clothes, expensive car. But if his house is shabby and it's not looking good, then it doesn't befit, it doesn't, uh, there's no, there, there seems to be no equation to it. So it means they are all interconnected stages. As Shaitan, he triggered this passion, it, it, it triggered many other passions. That's why Ulama say, the, those who restrict their appetite for food, it's easier for them to control other desires as well. Because this desire, it triggers other desires. This passion triggers other passions. And if a person is able to control this passion first, in the first instance, uh, then uh, other passions are easy for a person to restrict, to refrain himself from. And when Adam, peace be upon him, had the fruit, yes, same thing happened. What Shaitan desired, that thing happened. However, Adam, peace be upon him, I have discussed this many a times that his eating the fruit was not a kind of disobedience as that of Satan himself. His eating the fruit was based on ijtihad. Ijtihad is a legal exercise when a person uh, makes his effort to understand a particular thing and he interprets this his own way but there's least intention of disobeying God there's no intention zero intention is, is there uh, to disobey God in the case of Satan yes he directly refused to command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran doesn't say us that uh, said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded uh, uh, Adam, peace be upon him, not to approach this tree. And then he said, no, I have to approach it. I have to eat it. Come what may know. The case is, that is Satan who made this story and that was an attractive story that you will achieve the eternity and you will never be cast out and you will get the dominion which is unperished, unperishable dominion. So these are the things on the basis of which he made the, the, his, we can say, wrong opinion but not disobedience as that of Satan himself. So, he triggered his passion for food. And again, I repeat it, that one, once a person eats one unlawful or forbidden food, it triggers a passion more and more towards the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you restrict it, once we restrict it, and it helps us to to stop and to control other passions which may lead to the destruction of a person. In Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that a believer eats in one intestine, that is, is satisfied with a little food. And a disbeliever eats in seven intestines, that is, eats much food. 
because there's no concept of ibadah, there's no concept of concept of worship. It's just the life which revolves and which is which is revolving around his own nafs. And the story of Hassan rahimahullah, Hassan al Basari, is known a pious person. He was a tabi'i, and Uqba al Rasibi is among the Taba tabi'in. And he says, when I entered upon Al Hassan rahimahullah while he was having lunch, he asked me to join him, but I said, I have eaten my fill, so I cannot eat anymore. And he says, Subhanallah, glory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Should a Muslim eat until he cannot eat anymore? He said. Means we, we cannot live without the food, but this food must be in the uh, this must be taken in limit. If the limits are not observed, then apparently it, it seems to a person it is just mubah. I can eat as much as I can. Yes, that is mubah. But sometimes mubah takes a person to makru, and then that makru takes a person to the haram. When a person cannot stop his desire, specifically his appetite for food, then yeah, there, are, there are quite chances that that person may be pushed into the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when his nafs is accustomed to this, to this delicious food and too much food, then uh, if he doesn't get it, he may be forced to do something wrong to get it, to achieve it. So, uh, the best way to moderate our nafs the best way to control our nafs is to control our desire for food. We cannot eradicate it. We cannot live without the food. Even Ulama say that uh, a portion of the food is wajib upon us. How much is wajib upon us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kulu wa shirabu. Kulu wa shirabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink but don't be wasteful. So we have been allowed. And even this kulu wa shirabu, it is wajib. And ulama say, there's a portion of food which is wajib upon a human being. How much is wajib? That much portion of food is wajib upon us, which can help us to perform the ibadah. Because if we avoid the food or we take too little, that it will affect our health, that it will, it will affect our body, and it will culminate upon the weakening of our body, then that is haram again, that is again forbidden. So food is, it is wajib. Sharia says, Islam says that you have to take the enough quantity. How much? At least that much that can, uh, that can help you to perform the ibadah. That, that can help you to perform your day-to-day -day activities. It's not that a person is supposed to avoid each and everything. Just one morsel or two morsels in the morning, two morsels in the evening. You know, depending upon the nature of the work. Uh, depending upon the, the the gravity of the work, for example, they are laborers. If they take little amounts, then it will affect their work. When work is affected, their salary is affected. If salary is affected, the whole system of the family is affected. So Sharia has to consider all these things as well. So Quran said, "Kulu wa shirabu, you eat and drink, wala tusrifu, but do not be wasteful. Do not cross the limits." So israf is not allowed. Israf is that a person crosses the limits in both quality and the quantity. Quantity that is full, that now is dead tired. It is quite experienced that when a person fills up his belly, that now there is no more space for one single morsel, then will it make a person to be active or to be lethargic? Undoubtedly, a person will be too much lazy. Because too much food culminates at the laziness, too much laziness. It makes a person, it renders a person inactive. So his, his activeness is all taken away. That's why moderation is very important. In, our, one of, in one of our previous sessions, I discussed about the importance of moderation in Islam. So this moderation has to be observed in all aspects of life. That moderation is not specific uh, to any specific field. Rather, it applies to all walks of life. In all walks of life, we have to be moderate enough so that we don't cross the limits. So that, so that 
the skills are established. We have to observe the skills every, everywhere. We don't have to cross the skills. And same applies to the food. However, if a person feels that his, uh, his work is not so much tremendous or he's, he's not supposed to have the hard work, then he, he must lessen his food, but not to the extent that his health is affected, as I said before. Imam, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he has also scolded such people. He says some ascetics went beyond limit, limits in suppressing their desire for food and resisting the pain of hunger. Of course, this is not fair because what man is entitled to do is to satisfy this desire moderately. This moderation is realized in its best form when the Muslim follows the Prophet's instruction in this regard. So, how can we strike a balance? Prophet said that a person he must make a third of his belly for food. So stomach has to be, belly has to be divided into three parts. So one for the food, one third for, one third for the food, one third for drink and one third for breath. Means two thirds have to be filled up. But one third should be kept vacant. And this way, this will help a person uh, to, to strike the balance in his health. And we also know is uh, our quite experience those who fill up their bellies all the time means they, they take excessive food. They have to face many difficulties in, 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 in the form of many diseases because too much food leads to the many of the diseases. It seems that okay this food is quite nutritious, it's quite good. No, it's not necessarily because when excess is there, excess of calories is not also good for us. So there must be a balance, there must be a moderation in each and every aspect. And if this moderation is not observed, then it will lead to the inequilibrium. It will lead to the instability. And this instability is, will not be then affecting one's health, rather his ideas as well. His ideas, his thinking, his pattern, his way of, his way of, uh, his way of life will be also affected. So what we need to see this moderation, moderation in the food. And the first of all, a person should always think that whatever energy, there are certain adab and the etiquettes of taking the food, inshallah, we may discuss that in our upcoming sessions. Uh, one of the important things which we need to observe is that that uh, this food has must be from halal source. First and foremost thing, is that the food must be from the halal source. There should be no any source which is prohibited, which is forbidden. Because the food which is based on the prohibited sources or unlawful sources, this not only affects the health of a person, it affects the spirituality of a person brutally. And our ulama, Imam al-Ghazali, he, he says uh, that if ibadah is 70 parts. If we divide the ibadah, the worship for which we have been created, it is 70 parts. 69 is a risk halal. 69 points will go to lawful earning. And one point for all other ibadah. So it is immensely important for us to observe such things. So in this session, we just we are focusing upon the moderation. Moderation in taking the food. Moderation in uh, addressing our biological needs. So, it, be it food or drink, it must be taken in its proper quantity. Depending upon, as I said before, that we need to observe that the, the nature of the job of a person is also important. Because if a person, as I said before, is supposed to just have, uh, he's a laborer or he's a worker and his work is, uh, so we can say, uh, which requires too much hard work, physical exercises, which, never, which requires the physical efforts. Uh, at that particular point of time, a person is required to take such amount which can keep him healthy enough to carry forward all his day-to-day -day activities. But on the other hand, if a person, is, his nature of job is something different, then he, he's, he's supposed to lessen the food. And this lessening the food or decrease in the amount of the food will have, will, will have a lot of benefits, both 
physical benefits as well as the spiritual benefits. It's not only that a person will get only the, the physical benefits. As we know, the doctors, they always advise that we should not take enough food. Rather, we should take the food in moderation because that is important for the healthy body. We cannot have the healthy body without uh, having the less amount of the food. But at the same breath, at the same time, it has a lot of benefits in terms of spirituality. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a tawfiq to strike the balance in all, aspect, all aspects of life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq so that we can control the desires of the nafs. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us so that uh, we can strike a balance not only in taking the food, rather in all walks of our life. Amin. Subhanallah wa hamdihi, subhanakallahu wa hamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.